CCWIS Webinar, Data Quality Plan Improvement, May 25, 2022, Children's Bureau, Division of State Systems. Welcome to the Child Welfare Information Technology Systems Manager and Staff Webinar Series, brought to you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families Children's Bureau. My name is Phil Breitenbusher, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Today's discussion is entitled CWIS, Data Quality Plan Improvement. Uh, we are interested in your thoughts and ideas, so we are going to encourage your active participation throughout the webinar today. To ask questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature, which should be located either at the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen, depending on where your ribbon is located. Uh, we do ask that all questions be submitted to the Q&A feature versus the chat so that we can manage those questions. Uh, we see that there are well over 100 folks on the call today, so we want to be able to manage all of your questions. You can also ask questions throughout the presentation using the raise hand feature. Um, again, that is located in your ribbon. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, hit the button to raise your hand. We will see that your hand is raised. And then uh, one of us will chat with you privately just to confirm you're ready to ask, uh, ask that question live. We will unmute your line. Then I will call on you. Uh, to ask your question, and you will be able to unmute yourself. Um, if for some reason you've raised your hand by accident, uh, you can just let me know that by, uh, when I reach out to you privately via chat. Um, if you've called using, um, if you've joined our webinar using a phone call, you can also raise your hand by dialing star nine, and we will also see that your line, uh, that your hand is raised so that we can unmute your line. If we are not able to get to your question today, uh, we'll try to capture that question and respond to it after the webinar, but you're also able to follow up with us and ask questions by emailing us at cwis.questions at acf.hh.gov. ccwis.questions at acf.hhs.gov. In the call. Uh, let me first introduce our presenters for today. First, you're gonna hear from the director of the Division of State Systems, Teresa Young. Then you will hear from Sherry Binkle, who's a federal con contract support. Um, then you're going to hear from our state panelists, first from Delaware. You'll hear from Kim Pepper, Christine Weaver, and Christelle Davis. Uh, then you'll hear panelists from Oklahoma, Sherry Skinner, Tim Otter, uh, Melissa Hinman, and Adrian. Uh, Beeman, excuse me. And then lastly, uh, you'll hear from Utah, Odd uh, Berman Helm Hamlet, excuse me. And again, my name is Phil Breitenbusher, and I'll be your um, facilitator for today. I wanted to jump into our first poll now. Audience poll uh, number so one. Mind, please uh, engage with us here. Uh, we'd like to just know a little bit about our audience today. So uh, we will launch a poll here in just a second and let us know what your primary role that you play in relation to CWIS at your agency. You have several options there. Please choose one that best describes your role. We'll give you just a few moments to respond to that poll. Options include Information Technology Manager, Business IT Analyst, Project Management, Child Welfare Program Manager, Quality Assurance slash Continuous Quality Improvement, or other. Okay, just a few more seconds, if you don't mind, please uh, letting us know which of these choices best describes your role. And we are going to close out our first poll. All right, it looks like we have uh, a pretty diverse group, which is wonderful. Um, about a quarter of you um, identify with the role as business analyst or IT analyst, which is great. Um, another quarter though are saying a different role of some sort, but uh, we have 14% information technology manager, 8% uh, project management, and 12% in child welfare program manager, and another 13% as a quality assurance or CQI uh, role that you play. Wonderful. We appreciate you participating. We're going to go ahead and uh, move to our next poll. Audience poll um, number two. So we'd like to hear from you. How easy has it been to develop your state's data quality plan or DQP as we might refer it to it uh, throughout the webinar? Not easy at all. Fairly easy, a little bit challenging, moderately easy. We're getting better at it. Or, hey, it's a piece of cake. We've always been doing this. We'll give you folks a few moments to respond to this poll.
All right, just a couple more seconds. Looks like just over half of you have responded so far. Thank you very much. All right, and maybe some of you are saying, I'm not sure what a data quality plan is, and that's all right too. Well, this will be a great opportunity for you to learn about that. Let's go ahead and close out the poll. And um, yeah, just about half, not easy at all. 45%, 30% um, said fairly easy, but challenging, 26% uh, moderately, and only one person responded saying, hey, this was just a piece of cake. So we want to hear from you. <laughs> Maybe that's one of our presenters. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move to our third poll question here. Audience poll number right. three. Uh, does your data quality plan or DQP leverage other data quality efforts. So take a look at your options here. In this case, you can uh, select multiple choices. So you can select multiple. We'd like to know, are you able to leverage your data quality plan with other data quality efforts? We're talking about your CFRs, your, your PIPs, um, annual program services reviews, in cans, AFCARs, NIDIDs, et cetera. Okay, take a look at those and let us know if you're able to leverage these efforts. Child and Family Services Reviews, CFSRS, Performance Improvement Plans, PPS, Child and Family Services Plans, CFSRS, Annual Program Services Review, APSR, Federal Report Reviews, NCAMDS, okay, like AFCARS, so and YTD, Improvement Plans, we'll Title IV E-Reviews, PIPS, right, State now, CQI, Audits, Legal Responses, e.g. Consent Decrees, or other. All right, just a few seconds left. We see that more than half have now responded. We appreciate you engaging with us. All right, well, thank you all. Let's go ahead and take a look at these results. Okay, um, so we are, those that did respond, uh, which were about 92 of you uh, responded. Thank you very much. So 65% um, that you are able to leverage this, these efforts with your CFSR and PIPs, um, over nearly 60% are able to leverage with their CFPs and annual program reviews. Um, other 75%, really high number there with um, the other federal report reviews, um, over 40% with the 4E reviews and PIPs, and over 40%, 45% with the state CQI audits and legal responses. And then some other um, efforts that you're participating in your states as well. So that's really great to hear um, that you're able to kind of uh, leverage uh, these efforts into multiple activities. We appreciate that. Um, we appreciate you participating in our polls this morning, uh, this afternoon, as we get started. It does help our speakers kind of know a little bit about you as we get started with our uh, agenda for today. So let me go through our program. First, we will have an overview. Uh, then we will hear about the DQP model and project background. Um, and then we are going, you're going to hear some lessons learned and recommendations and DQP highlights from the states. Uh, we'll have a time for questions and answers. Um, then we'll recap uh, some of those lessons learned that you've heard from the states, kind of in a, a cheat sheet, if you will. Um, and we're going to leave you with some do it yourself DQP improvement materials. And then we'll close out today with some closing remarks and uh, another opportunity for final questions and answers. And then lastly, um, again, we'd like you to engage in a participant survey. Your feedback is very important to us. So when the webinar closes out today, you will be directed to a very, very brief survey, but we'd like for you to participate in that uh, to give us some feedback. Overview, data quality plan improvement. All right. I think with that, I am now going to hand things over to uh, Teresa Young. Teresa Young. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we appreciate your participation today. And I've talked to many of you, and I know that you uh, have taken the data quality requirements very seriously. So I really wanted to thank you. Uh, we do recognize this is uh, you know, fairly new and that we're continuing to evolve with these requirements. So I really wanted to just express my appreciation uh, for the work that you are all doing uh, to meet these requirements. 
and especially thank uh, those states who are working with us today uh, to do this presentation. Federal DQP efforts to date. Uh, and I think we've talked about this before, but really it's, uh, you know, all of the requirements are important, but this one especially, I think, uh, is, is really the crux of the issue, which is, you know, are we able to provide uh, data that has integrity that we can use to assess uh, how we're doing, how our performance is, and the effectiveness of the services that we're offering. So, um, it is a critical piece of CWIS, uh, and we appreciate, again, the efforts that you're making. And we thought we would do a little recap of you know, what we've done to date. So next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so far, we have done three uh, webinars. Uh, we have um, written technical bullets in six, which many of you have been using. Uh, and we appreciate that. We developed the CWIS data quality self-assessment tool. So if you haven't taken a look or started using that tool, uh, I think that is a, a valuable uh, tool to help you and for you to talk with your federal analyst uh, during your regular calls. Uh, once you start looking at that tool, if you have questions or thoughts uh, about how to show evidence, you know, that you're meeting those requirements, uh, please use the tool and we're open, you know, to feedback uh, as you begin to learn uh, and use that document. We also have provided targeted uh, technical assistance, which you're going to hear about today. And then this webinar. Next slide, please. It takes a village. When I speak to many of you, uh, you know, aside from uh, it being new in terms of us thinking about the new products, the new methods that we can use for automation to make sure that the systems are efficient and that they have functionality that help staff understand and use the data that is in the systems. Um, we know that it takes more than a CWIS project team. You know, we do hear from many of you, you know, that you feel, uh, I don't want to say powerless, but at least not able to impact uh, your organization as a whole to, to create the governance and to put in place the structure, you know, for really supporting all aspects of data, data quality, which goes beyond just the CWIS. Uh, so we do want to understand um, how we can best support your efforts, and you're going to hear that theme, you know, throughout this webinar. Um, we want to hear about, uh, we, we really want you to be thinking about data quality if you're in planning or early on uh, in the life cycle development of your system. Um, we think there is room for improvement there when we look at RFPs or uh, contracts we're really not seeing very much related to the automation uh, data quality requirement. So we do think there is room for us you know, to grow uh, in this area. And I think you know, throughout many webinars that will be coming up and many technical assistance uh, that we're providing, you're going to see at the federal level more efforts to really uh, bridge the linkage between the system development and program performance and the use of data. So these systems are expensive to build and to support. Uh, and I, at a minimum, you know, they need to provide data um, that really is informing you, you know, the worker and your administration, as well as the federal uh, government in terms of where do we need to improve, you know, and how are we doing? So it, aside from just uh, the data quality requirements in and of themselves, Again, just to emphasize that probably the most important piece of a CWIS is making sure that you have good data, you know, that the program needs and that you are using in the data. So uh, next slide, please. Gratitude and goals for today. I wanted to appreciate and call out Sherry Binkle as she has been working uh, very hard along with these states. You're going to hear from Delaware, um, Kim Pepper and her team in Oklahoma. Uh, Sherry Skinner and her team, and Utah, Aud Vermont Hamlet and her team. 
And we will talk about the efforts that they uh, have made in a target technical assistance project that they've been working on uh, for quite some time and their lesson learns. And they're also going to share some do-it-yourself materials that they've created. And we really appreciate them creating those. DQP model Next project slide, background. Okay, and I will hand this off now to Sherry. Sherry Binkle. Thank you. So I was asked, go ahead and go to the next slide. So I was asked to work with several states to develop a, some data quality plan models to kind of be able to share with other states. And so what we did is we selected agencies that were all at different places in their CWIS project because their focus of data quality may differ based on if they're just getting started or if they've already implemented their systems. So we decided the most important thing is to leverage existing information that was already out there. We weren't going to invent something new, but we were gonna pull data from three different sources. And at this time, these were the three main sources that were published. Um, so when we pulled this data out, we pulled it out by subject or we called it topic area. And then we met with each one of the states and we walked through the specific subject and their data quality plan as it existed today to help them build this model. And so it was a six to nine month project and it was quite successful. And I'm really excited for having you to have the opportunity to work with all these states and have three states be able to present. Next slide, please. DQP model, state introduction. So the states that are presenting today, Oklahoma, Delaware, and Utah, will go through their background. We'll talk about their lessons learned, but mostly what I'm excited about is they're gonna share sections of their data quality plan with you. So with that said, we'll go next slide and we're gonna have Oklahoma go ahead and get started. Sherry Skinner. Sherry. Thank you. Oklahoma um, background. I am Sherry Skinner and I'm the program administrator over our Oklahoma Child Welfare Information System, which we refer to as KIDS. So just to give a little background on Oklahoma, um, we are a state ran child welfare system. And um, geographically our state is broken out into five regions. Um, and those regions are actually similar in size based on the number of children that we have in care, but obviously very different in uh, land size. Uh, from those five regions, we break those out into 26 districts and we have 77 counties in Oklahoma. Our current population here is right at about 3.9 million and 24% under the age of 18. So just under a million kids. Next slide, please. Services. So presently we receive services wise, um, an average of 6,700 referrals a month and 2,800 of those are accepted um, as investigations. We serve just under a thousand children in our prevention services, which is 450 families. And um, I have a chart here that reflects the number of children in care by county. So as you can see, we have about 60% of our children in care come from 17 of our 77 counties, and those are reflected in the darkest shading there on the map. And 25%, just a fourth of our kids in care actually come from our two metro counties, which would be Oklahoma County and Tulsa County. Um, we have an additional 470 children that are currently being served through DHS who are in tribal custody. We have a large Native American population here. Next slide, please. Current child welfare information system. So just a little background information on our system. Uh, we currently have our OK Kids, which is our child welfare information system. Um, we're very proud of the fact here in Oklahoma that we were the first approved SACWIS system back in June of 1995, and that's still the same system we're working out of today. Uh, we are, like many of you, currently in transition to a CWIS system. Uh, KIDS has approximately 2,900 active child welfare users, and then we also have an external version of our KIDS system known as eKIDS, and we have an additional 500 users who access our system through the eKIDS. Um, just an important note to kind of keep in mind, Oklahoma has actually been in a settlement agreement um, through a class action federal lawsuit since 2012, and I just wanted to note that because that's something that still impacts the way we do business in Oklahoma and um, has certainly had, you know, a role in our transition to our CWIS system. So 
Next slide, please. Oklahoma, lessons learned and recommendations. I'm going to talk just a little bit about our data quality plan um, and the lessons learned, a little background. So understanding the scope of the data quality plan was a critical piece here in Oklahoma. Um, when we first heard the term data quality plan, it was sort of interpreted to be a document that was just about data. So even though I've been involved from the very beginning, I knew this fell under my scope. I didn't initially gather the right team to work on this. And so as we continued to work through this process, it quickly became more and more apparent that we had to bring in additional people since this was not just a technical document. Um, this was a significant hindrance, I would say, to the progress in Oklahoma. Um, so I really can't stress how critical this part was. Um, ensuring that you have the right players involved from the beginning. Earlier on, the better. Um, how we got it right, I would say in addition to having the right people was taking an approach of just focusing in on smaller chunks at a time on the overall document. Um, in Oklahoma, we have a very supportive leadership team, um, you know, up through our agency leadership and our child welfare director. So anytime I would go to her and, you know, ask for access to our executive leadership team. Um, she was always willing to grant that time and very involved with just whatever was needed to complete this, which I would say was a key part of just that open communication and getting it completed. Um, as for why this matters, all of this was a critical part of us completing our data quality plan. And I mean, we struggled for a while, just like I know many other states have. And so for us to be able to, you know, say that we have were able to get this, you know, completed, it truly defines how we do business here in Oklahoma, including setting our dating, data priorities. Um, the data quality plan in whole supports the work we do and um, truly goes to improve outcomes because this is the framework for how everything is measured in Oklahoma. So on that, I'm going to turn it over now to Adrian, who's going to talk about our RACI. And so next slide. Adrian Beeman, Roles and Responsibilities. Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Beeman. I'm a Programs Manager here um, at KIDS. And uh, I'll go over uh, the process that we use to develop our RACI. Our ACI, who is responsible, um, accountable, consulted, and informed. The RACI matrix does is it's, it's going to serve as that visual representation of the functional role played by each person. Um, so you're not looking just at um, the people that are working on the data quality plan, you're looking agency-wide or um, it's, it's a broader scope. So what we did um, when we wrote our uh, rough draft, we went through and identified key tasks and we pulled those tasks out for our RACI matrix. One of the things that um, it was a lesson learned. We had actual people, their names identified before, and I think we struggled really assigning that task to that person. So what we did is we assigned roles to roles and responsibilities versus the actual name of the person. And you'll see that on the next slide where we have our RACI matrix. And RACI is that acronym, and you'll see it here, it's responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And what you're doing is you're assigning that responsibility to a role. So uh, another thing to remember is only one person can be held accountable. And that's the person that has the ultimate final say-so. Um, you can have multiple people um, responsible, consulted, and informed but there is only one role that is accountable and that's that final decision maker. Um, so if you would go to next slide. This is a sample of our RACI. And so you can see along the left-hand side, we have pulled out that task from our data quality plan. Uh, and then we identified the roles across the top. And then we went through each task and assigned that um, the responsible or accountable informed and consulted each task to the role that is uh, up above. And you'll see um, each role, if you've identified it in your data quality plan, needs to be listed up at the top. So you wanna make sure you account for um, everyone. So we have our CQI, we have our field staff, we even have our CWCAs in there. 
um, and our liaison. So that's just a sample of it. It's designed on a, an Excel spreadsheet and we included it as uh, a part of our data quality plan in that section. And next slide, we'll go to, I'll hand it over to Tim. Oklahoma Security Strategies, Tim Otter. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next slide. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Otter. I'm a programs assistant administrator here at KIDS, and I'll just talk through a bit about uh, security and how we developed that for our data quality plan, how we worked that in. So developing our DQP gave us a good opportunity to evaluate all of our security measures and how those tie into data quality. Of course, security is built into our processes early and often, but incorporating security into our data quality plan really uh, caused us to consider all of the various ways that, that data security ties to data quality. And one of the things we realized is that initially our focus was a bit too narrow. And so as we continued to work through various drafts of our plan, we sort of broadened our scope when it comes to security. Uh, and you can see some of those, some of those bullet points here. And I'm just gonna touch on each of those briefly. So we do have within our system, uh, various security measures in place, such as restriction for various cases and referrals. Depending on the situation, we can restrict who has access to those cases and referrals and make sure nobody's getting in there that doesn't need to be in there. Um, same thing with our security levels. We have over 70 security categories that we can assign to people based on their needs and their, their role. But you know, we always like to start with the least amount possible so that people only have what they need to perform their job and then we'll build it out from there. Additionally, we do have the capability to run audit trails either on a user level or on a particular uh, case or referral or resource we can see who's been where and within our system. One of the things that I'm sure has been uh, very important for all of our organizations over the past couple of years, of course, is how we get access to our network in the first place. And so uh, we do that through our Zscaler private access, you know, with all the teleworking over the last couple of years, that's obviously been very important is making sure we have all the appropriate security in place they're just being able to access our system. And so if, if our users aren't running Zscaler, they have very limited access in terms of what they can get to through Microsoft Office 365. But in order to get into kids and, uh, and access the network, they're pretty much going to need to be on uh, Zscaler. And then lastly, we also brought in discussion about how we utilize mobile devices. So the vast majority of our field users are assigned uh, state-issued cell phones when they come on board to make sure that we have everyone communicating securely when it comes to you know discussing important case information and uh, we have measures in place that allow us to lock down or wipe phones remotely in case anything uh, happens if phones go missing or anything along those lines uh, right now users are able to, to access that same office 365 suite of apps from their phone uh, we don't have access to our case management system kids we don't have access to that through our uh, mobile devices but again like i said one of the things that this project gave us an opportunity to do was to evaluate our needs moving forward as we continued to transition uh, to a CWA system and so considering how we want to be able to access things remotely moving forward is something that we've taken into consideration as we've developed this plan so it was really a great opportunity for us to consider not only how our system works now, but uh, to be thinking forward about what we need our uh, system to look like in terms of security moving forward. But uh, I believe I'm handing it off to Delaware from here. Phil Breitenbusher. Yes, let's go ahead and uh, we'll now hear from uh, Kim Pepper. Delaware background, Kim Pepper. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, I'm Kim Pepper, the Strategic Information Systems Manager on our CBUS project. Um, we are the Department of Services for Children, Youth, and Our Families. And in our department, we are, um, we are inclusive of all of our child services for the state. We're a, state, a statewide um, agency, not county-based. 
Um, so we have family services, prevention and behavior health, <clears throat> youth rehabilitative services, and our management support services um, divisions, um, which all use our CEWA system. Our system includes all, all child work in the system. Our three, we have three counties. Um, our population is just under a million nine hundred eighty nine. 1,948, and this is from the 2020 um, census. And we have 20.9% of the population is under the age of 18. In 2021, we had just about a little over 20,000 um, intake reports and referrals. We had about 7,500 investigations and fair completed. We have, um, almost 2,000 families and children receiving services. And we average um, 483 children in placement monthly. We also, um, with our, our CWA system, we, it's called FOCUS for our children's ultimate success. And we have uh, 1,323 users, which includes um, our DSCYF staff and providers also use our system. Next slide. Delaware Governance, Guidance, and Collaboration. So we're going to touch on these five areas during our presentation. Um, interagency collaboration, technical bulletin six, data priorities, data governance board, and ownership. Um, interagency collaboration, I'm sure that um, you've noticed the word collaboration in our approach and our priorities. It was the key to everything that we did. Because DSCYF is inclusive of all child services and we serve the same clients, normal business practice is for us to collaborate. We had participation from each division as data quality has impacts across focus, impacting multiple divisions. The goal was to ensure buy-in and attention to the pain points. Data Governance Board was originally coordinated with our focus project staff. Uh, we weren't really making any progress, but we did meet bi-monthly. Once we started our project with Sherry, we quickly, quickly realized um, our board was not structured adequately. We needed members who had authority to make decisions and communicate back with the workforce. We adjusted and added our leadership to the board. Um, since, we've made, since, then, we made, since we made those adjustments, um, we've been able to move critical items forward. Every division is now um, also writing their own data quality policy policies in relation to timeliness um, integri and integrity. Um, I am the co-chair, our deputy, deputy secretary is the chair, um, and it, so our board is structured from the highest point, um, and we have the buy-in and we have the support. Since then, we've had a very productive meetings and have been able, oh, sorry, I've said that part. Uh, we have worked with Sherry, we followed the technical bulletin six, um, section by section, Completing the homework and the activities section by section was a key contributor to our success. We were able to dedicate time to each section and complete it. It really was another key piece to us successfully moving forward with our plan was Sherry helping us focus on one piece instead of trying to look at the bigger piece. Little chunks definitely helped us make um, quicker progress. Uh, Christy will also touch on our data priorities, um, as well as the importance of ownership and accountability for the data quality plan. Uh, but that's if. So next is governance. So I have more to say about the governance board. Setting up our path to success. Um, so we had an already established um, CQI data quality committee that had already had established needing improvement, areas of that needed improvement. This helped us, helped inform us of our data priorities in developing the data quality plan. Um, the data quality committee will be monitoring the data quality plan and ensuring that the steps, the action steps are being taken. The board is largely comprised of division leadership and product owners from each division and the department's information resource manager and focus managers. The board is chaired by the deputy cabinet secretary, which I already stated. Um, and the primary responsibilities are oversight of the Delaware Focus implementation, develop policies and support um, implementation to achieve 
priorities established in the data quality plan, review the data quality reports for all the 4E related child welfare programs, and to review the data quality reports um, for the state programs administered by DSCYF. Um, another immediate thing that we did um, after this project with Sherry was I had approached our Center for Professional Development, which is our training unit that trains classroom um, style for the business and policies and incorporates data quality language so that the first step in the door for new employees, they hear the language and we repeat it in our focus training. So there's no issues with buy-in because it makes sense. So um, they were happy to start talking this language in their trainings. And then when we get to the system training with the new employees, they hear the same messages over and over. Um, we provided a general overview of the key steps that we followed to develop the data quality plan and what is working best from our experience. Um, so I'm gonna now turn it over to Chrissy Weaver, who is our CQI manager to talk more about the priorities. Delaware Policy, Measurement, and Collaboration. Thanks, Kim. Christine Weaver. Um, as she stated, my name is Christine Weaver, and I am the CQI and Data Quality Manager with the Division of Family Services. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the priorities. So these are the priorities that we established um, after reviewing our CWIS needs and then the information from our CQI Data Quality team. Um, these were the three established priorities from our Data Governance Board. So for the first one, uh, creating, standardize, and enact department-wide and division-specific data timeliness policies and procedures, we chose to um, look at just a few things. Um, improve the timeliness of data entry for placement entry and exit data dates. And the second was to a timely response data entry for all initial interviews. Our second priority was to continue ongoing data completeness efforts to really bolster the complete entry and maintenance of valid data focused on key pain points we had, we had discovered. So to address this priority, we chose to focus uh, first on ensuring the completeness of data entry for caseworker monthly contacts. Um, our final priority was to centralize the person type data strain to really um, ensure that we had accurate demographic information and this, this priority is really quite complex. Um, so we have chosen to start small and address the following areas. We're going to reduce a duplicate person records in our system. We're gonna improve our accuracy of address information. Um, specifically, we have a problem with zip codes. And our third was to reduce manual duplicate data entry among our child welfare contributing agencies. So next slide. Ensuring alignment and vision. So at the rec recommendation of our federal team, uh, Delaware used the SMART approach to develop clear and concise goals. This was the best advice we had could have gotten, and we found this tool really, really helpful. SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Actions, Relevance, and Timeframes. So here's an example of how Delaware used the SMART approach um, to our first priority goal of timeliness in regards to improving the entry of initial interviews. So using the SMART method, we first defined our goal. Um, and then to measure the goal, we have decided that we need to obviously establish a baseline and, and the actual goal we want to set. We developed the listed action steps that you see and determined the relevance on how this goal impacts the overall big picture. We then determined timeframes for our actions. We then looked and assigned who the owners of this task would be. And then there's areas here where we can continuously put our updates on the progress that we've made. Next slide. Why we selected these priorities. So after going through the process, you know, Delaware offers some key takeaways. First and foremost, when establishing your priorities, you have to have the right people. You need to have the collaboration of leadership and the data quality team to really understand the key pain points that is impacting your data quality and how it impacts your overall child welfare system. You have to have that buy-in so decisions can be made when determining your action steps to work towards your problem resolution. Um, another takeaway was really do not set yourself up for failure. Limit yourself to a few key areas to focus improvement efforts. When choosing your action steps to address that area, make sure that it's something you can accomplish in that year. 
it may take take more than a year to address your priority and that's okay because this is a living plan. You just define what you hope to accomplish this year and then next year you build on what you accomplished this year. Having your leadership back your work by establishing clear standards and policy is also very important. Um, and we found using the SMART approach to be extremely helpful. It really helped us focus on what needed to take place and why. It also provides a great visual outline that you can present to your leadership or stakeholders. It's really easy to follow. Um, and our last takeaway was it's, it's also important to really update and monitor your data quality plan. Uh, DFS has a CQI data quality committee that was established about three years ago. And we already had some key pain points identified that we were working on and that was, was able to be fed into the data quality plan. So now this committee is going to be tasked with um, doing reviews on our data quality plan monthly. And we're gonna be ensuring the action steps are being taken by the assigned owners. So overall, Delaware really found the collaboration with the federal team to be very successful. And we now feel we really have a strong data quality plan. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass this to Utah. Odd Vermont Hamlet. Thank you. This is Odd Vermont Hamlet from Utah. I want to thank Kim and Sherry. I found so many similarities in your report in Delaware and Oklahoma for what has worked, uh, what were the challenges. I think I'm going to use the term pain points. I like Utah that. background. So, let me first walk you quickly through uh, Utah's background. So our, our state is similar in size to Oklahoma's, a little bit smaller, bigger than Delaware. I think what stands out is that um, our child population is higher than anywhere else. We have a 29% uh, portion of the population that's under 18. Um, I think that's the highest in, in the nation. Uh, we are like the other states in a transition um, with a legacy system that we're still using for our ongoing cases, foster care and in-home, we have moved our CPS cases to the CWIS system. So we're in, in that transition. Next, please. Services. Okay, briefly, we average about 3,600 intakes, intake reports or referrals. About half of those result in cases, um, and with about 750 victims a month, that's those are just monthly averages. Um, and in a point in time, we operate about 1,000, 1,200 in-home cases, and our point in time count of children in foster care is about 2,200. That's down from about 2,800 a few years ago. Um, so we are making some progress in reducing the number of children in foster care while at the same time having uh, an, an, an increase in population that is exploding. Um, part of our increase is because of the um, child childbearing um, uh, population is having more children than elsewhere, but also because people are moving into Utah. So we have a uh, constantly growing population, but we've been able to bring down our number of children in foster care. Uh, next, please. Lessons learned concerning data priorities. So lessons learned for us. It was interesting to listen to Oklahoma and Delaware because I think uh, I heard similarities with our process. Um, clearly, I think we 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 did bite off more than we could chew. We put a lot of things in our plan. And I think it was out of uh, an eagerness to wanna do well and put things in there. But we realized uh, in retrospect that it probably would have been wiser to put fewer things in there and have, uh, but focus on the important pieces. Um, so if, if we redo it, we would <laughs> pick fewer things and have, wider discussions about what are our priorities. Um, I think, or also looking back, we, we had huge turnover. The people who started the data quality plan are not there anymore. I came on part way. I, I was involved initially, but just peripherally and consulted on what should go in there. 
But taking it on at a later point, I, it became clear to me that I would now focus more on issues that pertain to programming, data entry, and data extraction. And what I mean by that is um, issues in our system that result maybe in incorrect data entry because maybe a drop down menu is too long or too duplicative or not clear enough. Um, resulting in incorrect data entry. Or when we extract data from our system to, for example, submit it to AFGARS or NCANS, um, are we extracting the correct da data if we are not clearly sure what this pertains to? Um, as we're moving stuff to, to our CWIS system, we are making sure that we're matching the definitions used in AFGARS and, and NCANS more than, than we had in our legacy system. Uh, so I would do, I would focus on these things more than on practice issues, that, that'd be my suggestion. And I'll, I'll show that and I'll highlight that on some of the examples uh, in just a bit. Um, I would connect with, and I saw in the, in the poll that was done earlier, um, that most states are connecting their uh, data quality plans with other federal requirements, such as the CFSR, the uh, CFSP, um, and, and PIP requirements. Uh, the two that I will be highlighting are two of our data, statewide data indicators that we need to work on for the CFSR that we've chosen to pick in our data plan. Um, and then the challenge, and I'm sure I'm not the only one to have that experience, uh, and other states are experiencing that, is the turnover that we've been experiencing, not just at the front end, at the caseworker level, but at a, in our um, administration, and in particular, in our information system administration and programming. It's been really tough to maintain this through this turnover. Thank you, Sherry Van Keel, for helping us uh, and working with us through those uh, turnovers that we've experienced. Next, please. Utah, DQP priorities. All right, so this is an example uh, of a um, goal that we set. Um, it's called Improved Incident Date Accuracy in, in supported or many states use substantiated child protective services, CPS cases. What you see here on the table is one of the seven statewide data indicators ours um, on maltreatment in care is not meeting the national standard of 9.6. Uh, as you can see clearly we have too high of uh, rate of maltreatment in care and when we started looking at our cases it became quickly evident that we had incorrect incident dates. Um, quite frequently. And so we dove into that a little more to look at what were the causes. And I'm sure what I'm reporting uh, here today is similar in other states. Um, what happens is when children come into foster care, they often reveal more abuse that has happened to them. As mandatory, mandatory reporters, our foster parents who hear this or therapists um, report that to our intake, and if this has not been investigated previously, um, a CPS case is open, and if it's supported, it becomes um, yeah, substantiated abuse, a re-abuse or a repeat maltreatment and an abuse in foster care if the date is not entered correctly of the incident. What we found out further is by talking to caseworkers that they often are uncomfortable uh, giving a date if the child is not clear when something happened. Before I came into foster care, this and this and this happened over maybe a period of time, or the child doesn't remember when it happens and or happened. And so the worker will default to the date that the report was made, which then automatically results in a child abused while in foster care. As soon as we start reading the uh, text, we realize it happened prior to foster care. So I'm sure that must happen in another state. Um, next, please. So using the same SMART um, uh, format, um, we, we determined what needed to happen 
uh, a number of things that we have already done, such as reviewing cases to see if the data is accurate, um, providing guidance uh, to staff about what to do when you don't know, an, when, when the child doesn't remember an exact date, uh, and to verify their incident date. A lot of caseworkers I talked to just said, oh, it defaulted from what intake entered, and then they never verified the incident date. So we are doing things, uh, our numbers are improving, we're not there yet. Um, my hope is that by now having identified the errors, um, and it, this is a purely entry error, uh, that we are tackling the issue. Um, but I'd be curious at a later point to hear if other states have made that same discovery or that same experience. Next. Okay, the next one that I picked is another one of the uh, seven statewide data indicators, and that's placement stability. Uh, as you can see, we clearly are not meeting the national standard of 4.4. We have made some progress, but our rate of placement stability is way too high. Um, again, looking at causes, one of the primary needs for us that was identified as being able to replicate this measure. And we thought we were doing the right thing, uh, but our numbers looked much better on our side. And I knew that we were not calculating it correctly. And also that we had issues in how we record placements in our information system. Um, we still are recording it in our legacy system, but we are in the process of programming it in CWIS. And in that planning phase, I've made sure to use the definitions of placements used in AFGAR. Currently, we are recording every move, everything all the time, even moves that are not placements. So such as a child being on the run, a child going home, a child on respite, a temporary absence, maybe at a hospital. All these things were recorded. We had some band-aids we put on in our reporting to make sure that we wouldn't report these as placements, but I am confident that when we finally move this piece to CWIS, that we should better track and record uh, placements. And also in the meantime, we've, uh, I think we've been able to replicate um, the federal measure so that we can dive down into the data. I, I can tell already from the data that it is more the front end of a case, the shelter placement that uh, hurts us in our numbers. So this is already a first step, but I think we clearly need to do more problem exploration with uh, an improved measure, a data measure that we can use on our side so we can dig into our, our numbers. Next. I think we can go next. Sections of the Biennial Review Results Report, CCWIS Data Quality Review okay. Instrument. The third part that I'm going to be uh, talking about is, and I'm just going to share the document that we're using. Um, so I think, tell me if you guys can see the spreadsheet here. Um, so we created a spreadsheet again with the SMART model and with various tabs at the bottom uh, to track various pieces. Uh, for example, here I see one data sharing between us and the Utah State Board of Education was one of our goals. This was completely put on hold as the uh, education system is in uh, transition as well. And so they are not able to connect with us. Um, we have, this is the incident date one that I was talking about earlier. So we go uh, through various, and, and as you can see, it's way too long. We have way too many things we put in there. Um, but that allows us to track who, where, when, what have we done? And then at the end, our update. Um, I, I would highly recommend the spreadsheet um, format. This helps us have an overview, um, but I would not put as many things in there. I think several 
people before me have made that same suggestion is to focus on those pieces that are important and repeat, have a connection to the CFSR and clearly pertain to data entry programming, data extraction, uh, like the example that I provided here. Phil, do you want to take it back from my screen share? Phil Brightenbusher. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Odd. So that concludes my part. I'll pass it back to the next person. Phil. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you all uh, to all of our state panelists. We actually have a few minutes now uh, that we'd like to just take a second and uh, engage our audience to see if you have any questions. Q and A, so state just panel. As a reminder: um, All of our participants are able to ask questions in a couple different formats. One, you can go ahead and submit a question in writing using that Q and A function that should be either at the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom uh, ribbon there. Uh, you can type your question there, and um, you can direct those to a specific state panelist um, or one of our uh, federal uh, panelists. Or, um, or you can submit the question uh, generally and uh, we'll respond to it the best we can. You can also uh, ask your question using your microphone by raising your hand and we can unmute your line so that you can ask a question that way. Okay. And it looks like we have someone who's uh, raised their hand. So, um, because you did that right when I um, asked you to do it, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your line. And so John, it looks like you have a question. You should be able to unmute your line if you'd like to ask the question now. Yeah, one thing we've been trying to come to terms with is we develop our DQ, our data quality plan, uh, which certainly we are doing as much for ourselves as, as for you all, but in terms of measuring quantitatively data quality, uh, you know, I think you're in AFCARS and, and we're relative newbies, but I, I think in AFCARS doing test runs, you get possibly some measures for error rates uh, in terms of meeting the business rules with data completeness and things like that for AFCARS or, or in PANS uh, or possibly even uh, CQI case reviews, you may track the number of cases that had data quality issues. You know, we're after quantitative measures. Uh, we're about to start implementing uh, CWIS in our data migration from our legacy app to CWIS. The data quality issue there's really got to be understood quantitatively so we can, can make sure that we have actionable items for remediating the data quality before it's uploaded to CWIS. My question is this, does anyone have, say a dashboard or anything that measures data error rates within their legacy app or within their CWIS? Uh, and not only measuring it for completeness or error rates as compared to what the business rule data population configurations would be, but also the length of time that data is either incomplete or incorrect. One of the things we've realized in Mississippi is most of our data quality actually happens downstream uh, during reporting processes when there's more scrutiny uh, to population numbers matching and things like that. And, and that's a real lag in the, the value you can derive from your data is this lag of it not being correct, the lag in time. It's just longer downstream before you can realize value from that. So I was wondering if any of the states or any of the ones that presented have robust measures for their current state of their data, their C, I mean, their foster care data. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate your uh, question there. Uh, any of the state panelists want to jump in and uh, provide a response? So this is Christine Weaver. Um, so with Delaware, we don't have an um, automated system that automatically like alerts if something's not entered, um, but we do run a lot of different data quality type reports to show um, if an event has not been completed. So all of our events have due dates on them. Um, and so we do run various types of you know, due date reports as well as you know, past due date reports. 
so that um, supervisors and managers can know when something hasn't been completed in our system. We also have some reports that we use to um, determine um, if the placement, the, if there's a placement entered. So we have a report that for all of our kids are in custody. If there is, they're showing is not being any kind of placement. We have a report that shows that Then I look through every week and then I can send emails out to the staff and say, hey, you don't have your placement in. We really need to get this in. Um, we have the same type of thing for custody. Um, we really use um, the AFGARS validation reports and the NCANS validation reports a lot to do data quality reviews to find missing information. Um, for example, our periodic reviews from um, the AFGARS, we, when we first built our new system and we had a lot of errors and we were missing a lot of periodic reviews, um, for Delaware, our periodic reviews are, are basically our court order, our court entries. So um, when we looked at it, we really found that there was a lot of court orders or periodic reviews missing. And um, based on that report, I went through each one and I was able to reach out to the workers to find what was the problem. And you know, we were able, by doing that, we were able to see that here we have, some of it was data entry, but a lot of it was our court, our court hearings weren't being scheduled timely by our legal system, um, specifically after when there was a TPR petition. And that's because the courts were hearing the TPR petition and not realizing like they were also having a periodic review. So we had to meet with the courts and determine that they, you know, it was a periodic review. It, it was a review type hearing. Um, and also the two different orders be issued. We have our petition, TPR petition order and we also would have our dependency type order. Um, so we, we do have a lot of different types of re reports, and then we do analysis of those, humans do the analysis of those reports um, regarding some data, data quality. We're also in the process of building timeliness reports specifically to measure, um, and that's one of our priorities on this plan, um, you know, placement entry and exits, um, our initial interview, which is um, you know, response time on the, to the hotlines, called in and reports of abuse and neglect, uh, making sure we see the victims timely and um, you know, and starting those monthly contacts go up or, or entered. I hope that answered some of your questions. So this is Kim Pepper. I'll just add to that something that I didn't mention during my presentation that we do. So when we started working on our data quality plan with Sherry, um, we were able to see how this affects our across our department. So each division in our department now has a data quality um, committee that meets monthly. And during those monthly meetings, data quality is what the discussions are. Um, and as things are brought to attention that are cross-cutting, the chairs of those committees will share that information with all the chairs so that each division can work on those pieces. This is in addition to all the reports that get ran um, for the data quality efforts that we have. So we do have monthly meetings happening across all of our divisions to talk specifically about data quality, the impacts of it, poor data quality, how it has an impact downstream for other divisions. And um, we've been very successful in finding issues that way as well. This is Ode from Utah. Um, similar to what has already been said in Utah, we have some a mixture of um, reports that show uh, due dates for various pieces that need to be entered and completed by. And this is available to supervisors, administrators um, at the team level, office level, region level, and state level. Uh, we also have some automatic features that alert either um, staff or their supervisors or their directors that a piece is not entered yet. For example, if we have a child in foster care and there's no placement entered or um, some other pieces that are essential, there will be automate, automatic alerts or reminders or prompts that go out, uh, letting people know that a piece is still needed. I think, and I'm not the best person to talk about it, but I think we have nightly reports that are run and uh, verification that go, making sure that there are placements entered and certain pieces entered that 
um, otherwise send alerts to people that a piece is missing. I hope that answers your question. Phil. Yeah, thank you to each of our panelists for the response there, some very tangible um, solutions there. Um, we did have another question that's coming through our question and answer dialogue box. Again, uh, if you do have a question, feel free to submit those using the Q&A and or using the raise hand feature and we can unmute your line. Uh, but this question's just come in and I'm gonna let uh, Teresa Young respond first and then I would open it up to our panelists. Uh, the question is this, what types of automated software are each state utilizing to assess, remediate, monitor, and report out on quality data? Teresa, you wanna take a swing at that? Sure, I would say states are using lots of different tools. Uh, the ones we probably see most often are um, ETL tools to move the data you know, into a data warehouse or a data lake. Uh, states have various different kinds of dashboard tools like Talent, Open Studio or SAS or SPSS and folks are using, some are using uh, Experian with Pandora. Um, so I'm sure there are, are some others probably, and we're learning right along with you as, as these new tools uh, are developed and become available. And other folks are really focusing on the system itself in terms of uh, you know, making the system more user-friendly. And, and one area I think that we see where there could be improvement is uh, the error messaging that is within the systems. You know, I think it's sometimes very general and it's confusing sometimes to the end users, they get an error message but they're not quite sure exactly, you know, what the error means uh, because sometimes we're kind of seeing generic uh, descriptions and they have to kind of hunt around and figure out where they need to go, you know, to correct that uh, data entry error. So something within a system, I think that that would help uh, is really thinking about, you know, what kind of error messaging do you want and do you have and how easy is it, uh, you know, for a staff to use to really assess their data and correct their data. Um, but I would open up, sure, there's others, but those are just off the top of my head. Phil Brighton-Busher. Well, from our state panelists, are there any others that you'd want to add to that list? It looks like, Teresa, inside the question and answer, somebody did, um, it looks like someone submitted um, some other tools they're using. Great. So at Takama, uh, in, Informatica um, are two that they're using there, it looks like. All right, excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Um, all right, actually, I'm going to go ahead and move us along. You can continue to submit your questions to our panelists uh, using the Q&A functions or raising your hand. We have another opportunity for questions in just a moment, but I'm going to hand things back over to Sherry at this moment. Recap, Sherry Benkel. Thank you. I'm just going to do a quick recap. We're going to go to the next slide that has lots of detail on it. Key Don't lessons worry, learned and recommendations. Um, just to reiterate what's been said is that the scope of a data quality plan is not limited to just your CWIS group or just your IT teams. It really is an agency-wide effort. Um, and if you talk to different areas within your agency, you will find different priorities based on who you speak to. So keep in mind, data quality is, is a necessary um, uh, task for eligibility, for finance, for contracts, for field staff, for your administration. It's for everybody. And so you really do want to make sure that when you're building out your scope that you understand it is an agency-wide plan. And when you're building your team, what we have learned in this process is that you need somebody who has the authority to make decisions. You need someone who has the authority to be able to assign work to other individuals. Um, having that authority, at least one person on that team with that authority really did make a difference. Um, and make sure your David governance is in place um, and that they have clear defined roles and responsibilities as well. And if all possible, you always want to remove some of the competing priorities that are out there. Um, when you're looking at your um, size and the time frame, and if you're going to move forward with, with doing your data quality plan and trying to update it to make it current, you definitely want to break things up into manageable and sizable sections. I think when you try to tackle the entire data quality plan, it just becomes overwhelming and it's not really actually well thought out for each section. So my recommendation is to keep trying to bring it down to the small sizes. And that was something that I think we all learned through this process. 
um, and other things just to consider. Vendor support is always nice to have, but it is not necessary. A lot of places were saying, oh, well, I didn't have a vendor help me on it. And that's okay, because even if a vendor is helping you, you're still gonna have to require, have intensive input from the agency in order to establish those priorities and to get that buy-in from leadership, because leadership is gonna be key in this. Um, and also please include your CWCAs in this process because they have to also produce data quality um, results or your data that you're receiving from them is not going to work very well for you. So establishing who your CWCAs are before you get started really will help you in this process as well. And I'll go to the next slide. Do it yourself, DQP improvement so what we've materials. Done is we took all the information that I pulled together for these teams, which is not my information. It is the information that's been published that's out there. As we mentioned earlier, a lot of it came from Technical Bulletin 6, but it also came from webinars that have already been done. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we have three different materials that we'll be sharing with you. Um, a preparation checklist just to kind of get you started, starting to think about what kind of roles you want to have in your team, um, as well as some management task recommendations. We've also built a gap identification tool. It is actually what I use to identify the gaps in the, the current data quality plans when I work with each state. Um, so this tool will hopefully help you as well. And then a data quality plan improvement PowerPoint. So please don't be intimidated. It is like 100 pages. And all it is is it takes each and every topic that you cover in a data quality plan and pulls all those resources into one area. So this is kind of a way to help you leverage what's already been published out there, but it's by topic. Um, so it crosses all across the technical bulletin as well as PowerPoints that have been presented in the past. So I'm just going to give you a little sneak peek. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Preparation checklist. Uh, sneak peek. So this is kind of just a, a sample of what is in the uh, preparation checklist tool, reminding you to make sure you have assembled governance if it's not already in place, um, as well as going through some time management recommendations if you decide to recreate kind of what we did um, as a team with each one of these states. Um, we're always recommending that, that you don't put everything in one meeting because I've seen us try to do that in states that I've worked in and I recommend trying to piece that into smaller parts. So time management is definitely a recommendation on this tool. We can go to the next slide. Gap identification tool. I think most of you will find the gap identification tool to be very helpful and all it is is it takes exactly what was already published to date about a particular topic and says, do you have this in your data quality plan? So if you wanna know, do you have everything covered, this gap identification tool will help you do it. But it's also going to help you go through and identify like what page number do they need to update? What is the exact gap? And then what is the content needed to close that gap? What do you have to do? So it isn't just a tool to say, do I have it, don't I have it, but it also could be a useful tool for you to measure and to maintain and to identify where your gaps are, and then also assign that workout. So the next tool is the PowerPoint. And so it's broken down into giving you a little bit of background um, about what we did and some lessons learned that we just went through. Um, but it also tells you a little bit about the regulations and then it's sectioned into groups. And so each one of those sections for us was a one hour meeting. So that's why they're brought together in those sections and they also related, um, but it's not a section or a table of contents as much as it is uh, groupings of the different topics together. So you could go into there and on the bottom, you'll see on those slides, it'll tell you the exact source on where that information came from. Nothing was new or reinvented besides for some examples, because as we got into our data quality priorities and applying that smart, I found that the states really needed more and more examples and more and more discussions on different ways they can present it. Because it doesn't have to be in the same format as what we recommend. It just needs to be that specific so that you have something that you know you can work on. And if there is turnover, because it happens, then you know how to pick it up and move forward with it. Um, so being specific is not just good for the, your agency as well as for ACF who's reviewing it, but it's also very good for if you have turnover, someone else can pick it up and say, okay, this is our focus. This is where we need to go. So hopefully these three items will help you um, move forward to, to updating your data quality plan and making sure it addresses all the things that have been published to date. And I'll go to the next slide. Closing remarks. 
I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over um, to uh, Teresa for some clo uh, closing remarks. Um, thank you, appreciate it. And thank you, States, you did a wonderful job. Tressa Young. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, as you can see, we've really been trying to think through different ways uh, to work and partner with you to improve data quality and work on these plans and begin to uh, work on the uh, biennial review, uh, which for many of you uh, should probably be coming up uh, soon. Um, so we've thought about you know, different things that we could do. And some of the brainstorming ideas that we've talked about is maybe setting up a community of excellence or a user group that is uh, strictly focused on data quality uh, and CWIS you know, automation. And uh, so we'd be interested in your feedback on some of these ideas and also interested on your ideas. Um, we thought about doing a similar kind of project that we did with the data quality plan, which is you know, to produce uh, some models that we can share with other states for the actual biennial review report. So if that is something that you know, there's a, an interest in, uh, we can certainly look into that. Uh, we can do some learning labs you know, on specific topics or areas where folks uh, may be struggling. Um, we're certainly open to helping agencies identify resources uh, that they need and working with your leadership. Sometimes we hear you know, that folks don't really feel like it's a priority or that it's supported enough you know, at the leadership team level or maybe a lack of understanding uh, of what this takes. Um, so if you need help with that or you would like us uh, you know, to have conversations with your leadership to help them understand you know, what this requirement is and the level of effort that it takes, uh, we're happy to have those conversations. Uh, if there are other ideas that you have, uh, please feel free to, you know, to put them in the chat, to uh, you know, open up your mics, to talk to your analyst. Uh, we know that this is uh, you know, something we're all going to be working on uh, over a prolonged period. Um, and we want to you know, partner with you because it's critical um, and, you know, as you can see from, from this, it's a, a very good start, uh, very good work that folks are doing. So please let us know what can be helpful. And again, I just want to thank uh, Sherry. Um, I know this was considerable time. I think you mentioned six to nine months. So I, I think that is a really important takeaway um, in terms of how much time and effort uh, it really takes uh, to do the work. So uh, again, thank you. And thank you to the three states uh, who presented today and engaged in this process with us. Um, lastly, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the open learning, uh, you know, and I guess I would just encourage all of us, you know, to continue with that attitude of we're learning as we go. Uh, it's not perfect and, and we know that. So again, um, thank you for your courage uh, in sharing your learning with us today. Um, so thank you so much, and I will turn it over to Phil. Phil, audience poll number four. All right. Thank you very much, Teresa, and um, all of our panelists today so far. Uh, we do have one more poll here that we'd like to uh, engage uh, with you on, and this one is asking about challenges in developing uh, your DQPs. So let me go ahead and launch this for us. And uh, this one says, uh, what challenges did you encounter when developing your DQP? Uh, in this case, you can select more than one. Scope, DQP, team data, governance, commitment, staffing, data quality priorities, biennial review planning, no challenges, other challenges, please list in Q&A. All right, I see your responses coming in. About 20% of you so far, thank you very much. All right, excellent. Uh, just over half have already responded. We'll give you just a, another, a few more seconds and then we'll go ahead and take a look at these results. All right, let's take a look. All right, so um, what we're seeing is um, about 45% of you said that you are encountering challenges of uh, the scope, recognizing uh, data represents all aspects. 
let's see here. We're also, uh, oh, excuse me, all aspects of the agency. 61% uh, um, said that the DQP team and data, data governance is, is missing key people. Um, we see 64% of you said a challenge was around commitment. 43% uh, said um, around priorities, 61% around staffing and staff turnover. Um, others said that the bienni biennial review planning was a challenge and uh, nobody reported that they had zero challenges. Um, and I, I don't see any other challenges um, in the, oh, if you do have other challenges, you can list those also in the Q&A. So thank you again for um, um, sharing that with us. And uh, we're going to now move to um, final questions and answers for today. And we did have a question that's uh, that's come in to our Q and A box. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, we have just a few more minutes, but we try to respond to all the questions. Uh, you can submit those through the Q and A box, or you can raise your hand, and I can unmute your line. So here's a question I'd like to uh, throw out to our panelists: uh, Duplicates is a problem with most states when looking at data. Can you share plans of how this has been handled when building your CWIS system? So I think this question is directed towards our state panelists. Um, any of you can jump in and let us know how you've responded to this. I mean, I would certainly agree that this is Sherry Skinner from Oklahoma, and I would certainly agree that this is a problem, I think, across the board. It's a, certainly one that we are, you know, constantly working to um, resolve here in Oklahoma. I don't know if I have a, a solid solution, but I will say it's one thing that, you know, one approach we've taken here is knowing that we have um, duplicates in our system and we wanted to try and reduce that number as much as possible prior to converting over to a new system. And so we actually, um, you know, prior to 2020, when a lot of things <laughs> changed just with how we do business, we had actually, uh, created an overtime plan for staff to kind of go through. And, and we certainly have exception reports that run to try and help us identify those. Um, but we have to keep it very strict, I would say. So, I mean, it's certainly looking for, you know, actual matches on the date of birth and social security number. And, um, or even we do have additional reports that'll look for like one digit off in the social security number and date of birth. And then I have staff that are manually having to go through and resolve the discrepancies in the data. But then we do have a batch job system that runs nightly. Um, and so as long as everything is a, you know, one-to-one -one match with the information, um, we have an automated process that merges those duplicate client IDs each night. Um, so that's a huge part of it. But for us, it's, it's more the issue with the ones where there's missing data or incorrect data that you know, truly take time to actually go in and resolve before those can be merged to eliminate the duplicate clients. Phil Breitenbusher. Excellent, thank you, Sherry. Um, any other state panelists wanna to respond to that and how you're addressing duplicates when in the build of your CWIS specifically? Okay, one more question here. How many staff in FTEs, full-time uh, employee equivalents, if you can, do you have dedicated to handling data quality, including resolving potential duplicates? So again, to our state panelists, uh, maybe even just an estimate um, on how many full-time employee or FTEs do you have dedicated to hand handling data quality? This is Ode. Um, in Utah, we have zero people dedicated to data quality. It's all people who have other tasks and functions um, that are working on, on data quality, not one specific person or one specific position. I wish. Thank you for that response. I... <laughs> in Delaware, we do have a unit. Um, we call them our focus liaisons. Um, right now we have three and they do the duplicate merges. Um, I also pitch in and um, Crystal Davis, like we pitch in to help that we, we manage that unit. We also have trainers specifically for our system. So they also have their hands in um, 
not only training about data quality and the importance of it and how it affects people downstream, but they also do pitch in and um, help the liaison team. We have lots of duplicates in our system. Um, we have a mailbox where all the users email the mailbox with their, with their needs, with the system, if they make mistakes, if they're having problems, or if they find duplicates. And our team manages that mailbox and um, handles each request one by one. Great, Bob, thank you. I, I can add, um, for Oklahoma, we have approximately 40 staff, um, 40 FTEs as part of our kids team. Those are divided up into six units. And I would almost say every unit has a role in the data quality and the validation of the data. Um, but even more specifically, I do have two units, a state reporting unit and a federal reporting unit. And I would say that's probably the main focus of those two units in ad addition to re responding to data requests would be the validation of the data. And that's an ongoing process. Wrapping up. Great. Well, uh, again, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today, uh, starting with our director, Teresa Young, and of course, Sherry uh, Binkle for your leadership on this project. But um, in particular, I'd like to thank each of our state panelist teams uh, from Delaware, Oklahoma, and Utah. Um, the leads from each of these teams, Kim Pepper, Sherry Skinner, and Odd Berman Hamlet have agreed to share with you their email addresses. Kimberly.pepper uh, at Delaware.gov, so like Sherry.skinner at OKDHS.org, Abermond at Utah.gov. Um, also, each of these teams have been willing to share their data quality plans on CSWAP. So uh, those of you that are uh, CSWAP users, you can log in and should be able to access each of these data quality plans um, there and download, download them there. Um, if you have any troubles getting into CSWAP, go ahead and reach out to your assigned analyst. They may be able to help you. Um, or of course, you can email us um, and we can connect you that way as well. Um, again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our participants. Um, we are interested in your feedback. So please, uh, when you exit out here, you should be directed to this uh, web, to the survey, the satisfaction survey. We do take your feedback seriously and try to incorporate your feedback as we work um, to improve each month's webinar. Thank you very much for your participation today. Thank you for the work you do on behalf of children and families. And this will now conclude today's webinar. Thanks to everyone.